So um, welcome everyone to, uh, to episode number five of the Coastal Insights, Raincoast's online inspirational conservation education program. Uh, I'm coming to you today from the uh, traditional unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. And uh, I'm very excited to be here today hosting what will be a really great episode. So uh, one of the central themes of our program so far has been salmon. My microphone is buzzing. Is it still buzzing? Maybe I'll just remove my microphone. Well, so uh, salmon. Salmon are a central part of, of what we do at Rain Coast, And uh, we are going to have actually two episodes focused specifically on salmon just because of the, the, the central role that they play in, uh, in our ecosystems here on the coast. So uh, today's, today's episode is going to be a little bit different than those in the past. Um, we had alluded to this a little bit prior, but um, we, have, we have one of our junior leaders here with us today. So this is one of our leaders from the Salish Sea Emerging Stewards Program. Um, he's been working with us for quite a while, and he's been uh, basically becoming a rain coaster. He's been learning the ropes, and so we'll get to see a little bit of what, what sort of mentorship in action looks like, and then we'll get to hear from a... Uh, a research scientist who works specifically on salmon. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, we are Rain Coast Conservation Foundation. We are, uh, we are here to, to inspire, to, to educate, to, to do research, and to create change, all specifically on the really working with the, the wildlife of coastal British Columbia. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist for the day. So we have Ryder Wise here. Um, Ryder, can, we, uh, can you yeah. give us a wave? There you are. Yeah. Hello, Ryder, how you doing? So, so Ryder is one of our junior leaders. He's a student that came with us on our sailing trips last year and we enjoyed having him so much that we ended up keeping him. So Ryder is going to be uh, going to be joining us today for a little bit. So I'm just going to ask Dave um, and myself. We're just going to shut off our videos for a few minutes, and we're going to let uh, let Ryder do his thing. Thank you very much, Ryder. Awesome. Appreciate that, Nate. So if I just get myself set up here, I'll share screen. Nate, I think you just got to make me the host there, and then I can share. I believe Mo actually needs to do it because she never de-hosted me. Oh no. Is Maureen here? Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. I can do it. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right, you're good to go, buddy. Okay, just getting it set up here. And then home. Slideshow, play. All right, is everybody getting my screen there? The Rain Coast Conservation Foundation Emerging Stewards? Yes. Awesome. So yeah, as Nate said, my name is Ryder Wise and I do believe I'm the youngest panelist to date at 18 years old. I was a part of the 2018-2019 Emerging Stewards program and I got invited back this year in 2020 as a junior leader, which I've been dubbed. I'm happy to take on that role, but I'm not so happy to not be out on the Achiever vessel where I would much rather be teaching than here in my room. And so let's get started. Today's topics will highlight the salmon life cycle, threats to salmon, and I hope to introduce to you nicely a new hybrid salmon that was hybridized here at my home at Lake Couchin in the Couchin River. So I'm a part of Rain Coast, but who am I? What are my morals? You know, what am I involved with? The summer of 2019, I was involved with the Couchin Lake and River Stewards and Ship Society, and I was a student riparian technic. And what I did during that job was geological surveys, erosion control, native planting and invasive removal. And all this knowledge kind of gathered and accumulated and was only furthered with my involvement in the 2019 season with Rain Coast. And as you can see there on the left, it's me and Nate, man in the vessel of the Achiever. 
myself at the bottom left on Russell Island where they taken us, and then a few other students and the life cycle of the Pacific Salmon poster. So as a student riparian technic and a Rain Coast junior leader, that's about as much as I have to say about myself until I get started on threats to the salmon life cycle. So right off the bat, we have some of the most important ones, poor forestry practices, which leads to freshwater habitat loss and clear cut mountainside erosion, where we have floods of mountainsides going down the slope into the lake, carrying all that topsoil sediment and leading to poor water conditions for salmon. Climate change has also began to alter water temperature and chemistry. What I mean by that is our water is becoming more acidic. In the ocean, the atmosphere is reacting with the surface of the water to create bicarbonate and carbonic acid. And that is not good because a 0.1% change in the pH of our ocean is gonna make it 30 times more acidic. And we can't have that. All this gathers up to diminishing populations from overfishing, noise pollution on our coast, oil spills, and the encroaching threat of the Atlantic salmon migrating its territory quite possibly down here all the way up towards Vancouver Island. There are many more natural threats to salmon, like orcas, bears, seals, and coastal wolves, but since they're a part of the food web, I just decided to keep them at the bottom. And just to the right here, we have two posters that describe the life cycle of the Pacific salmon, and best, the Pacific salmon life cycle poster by DFO, which shows the entire circular cyclical effect that salmon have throughout their entire life. From egg, to alvin, to smolt, to marine phase, all the way through spawning phase, this is their repeated cycle. And now I would just like to begin on the Couch and River's new hybrid salmon. This salmon was rightfully discovered by Andre Zarujo and Will Duguid. They are two biologists with DFO and Couch and Tribes. They had discovered this salmon back in October of 2019, and CNN actually released a small press release October 29th. But the implications of this new salmon are very, very unknown. All we know about this salmon to, to date, to start, is this salmon was a second generation spawn, meaning it had already hybridized at the mouth of the river, flushed out into the ocean, and came back up to spawn again until it was discovered. Some other things we've known about this salmon on its phenotype, so by observation, it has a wider square tail base with more muscle mass on it and prominent black spots on its back and tail fin. But beyond those things, the scientific paper which will be released on this salmon in September of 2020 will have all the facts better conveyed than I could. I find this salmon very interesting because it was discovered right here at my home on the Couch and River and unknowingly as my job in the 2019 summer as a student riparian technic, I was doing the Couch and River cleanup. And without even knowing at the same time, these salmon were spawning up the river. And something important I think to note about salmon is when they come back to spawn, let's say 2000 come to spawn or 2000 eggs are laid. Only about 1%, so one to two salmon out of those will return to the river. And so that's very bad for diminishing populations. So a little bit of a summarization so far. This hybrid was a cross between a Chinook salmon and a coho salmon. It'll weigh 10 to 25 kilograms. The scales are misaligned, silver in color with prominent black spots and on the back and tail fin. The fish will run from late October through early December. Now, just to take a, mo just to take a moment, we're going to question ourselves. This is what I did during the Couch and River cleanup, thinking about salmon. I thought, why do salmon turn red in their spawning phase? An interesting enough question. That's an observation we can make on salmon. 
And through my research, I discovered that these salmon, when they turn red, is because they consume 99% of their diet out in the ocean during their marine phase, and only about 1% of their diet during their spawning phase. And so the salmon will actually begin to assimilate itself, kind of like eating itself. And so it releases, well, the scales are assimilated into the fish and a, what's called a carotenoid protein is more visible as the scales diminish. And interestingly enough, this carotenoid protein is also what, what gives carrots its orange color pigment. So same with salmon. And I thought that was an interesting fact. Another question we can ask is how does spawning overlap occur? How was this fish hybridized? Well, it was actually hybridized likely because of all the threats posed to these fish, but we don't know that for sure. What we're thinking, which isn't confirmed, is that poor forestry practices have diminished all the creeks and made them dry during the season when Chinook will run, when coho will run in late December. And the, Chin and the Chinook salmon will only run like early August through September. And so to have overlapping spawning time, you also have to have overlapping spawning grounds. And so these are natural crossbreeding barriers that were crossed by the fish to allow it to be hybridized. But the most important crossbreeding barrier is the semi-permeable membrane on the egg that the salmon lay. Because typically, salmon eggs membrane only allows for the same species sperm to penetrate and fertilize the egg, thus to birth a new fish. This wasn't the case. And we don't know if it was the Chinook egg and coho sperm or the coho sperm and Chinook egg. This will be very important in future years for reciprocal cross. That is where you take a male and a female and then you reciprocate it and it could lead to an entirely different new species. But like I said, for all the facts and properly conveyed knowledge, the scientific paper will be released in September of 2020. Now, all this talk about the salmon life cycle, why it's important, how they're a keystone species here on the coast unlocking the entire food web. We know we need to protect salmon and I propose adaptation action plans, also known as apps. I would say kids need more apps these days, but not the ones on your phone. I took action in my action plan, just on your bottom right here, during a lunch hour actually, just to talk to this young boy, Yuri. What we did is made necklaces. Now that could seem like a very boring, tedious hobby, which at times it is but it's perfect ground to convey this knowledge to a young boy to inspire him. And just above also, during a lunch hour, I had done a bake sale for Rain Coast after my 2018 season as an emerging steward, where I raised funds for their Nadia tenure, just picture here in the middle of the screen, which is land that they own the hunting rights to. Everything in green, Rain Coast owns, everything in red, they would hope and plan to own. With that being said, I would like you guys to start brainstorming right now an adaptation action plan that you could somehow incorporate into your community and possibly raise funds, spread awareness, or advocate on behalf of Rainco, such as I did. The final step, what can you do as an individual in your hometown, in your community, you could simply mail some money to Rain Coast, which helps out a lot with their field research and putting down payments on these 10 years of land. Or you can get out in the community and inspire youth, advocate, become a part of this. I would like everyone in the audience to start stewardsonship in their community. I would like to introduce three riparian species, if you would mark them down, the red osier dogwood, the black cottonwood, and the Pacific willow. These are three magic species because they produce their own rooting hormone, and I learned this through my riparian work, that are planted on the foreshore of any watershed, which 
increases things such as shade over the water, foliage droppings into the water, and improves the overall ecosystem, especially in estuaries where it is most important. That was about all I had today for my presentation to share. I would just like to thank you guys for tuning in to me and appreciate all the ears listening. And remember, I wrote this one down. I dare you to improve the coast in some authentic way. And if you fail, you fail daring greatly. And I think that's magnificent. So thank you so much for listening to me, you guys. And I would hope to speak more to you in the future in another episode. Now, Nate, wow. I'm just gonna figure out how I pass the screen back to you. Okay. Oh, uh, Ryder, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I hope for you students out there that, that you guys get a little bit of a, a better idea of, of what, we, what we do with our junior leaders and, and that potentially in the future you could possibly take part um, in this awesome program. Thank you for telling us a little bit about yourself um, and and what you do and 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 your home. So we're gonna we're gonna take a shift here now. So Ryder, I'm gonna get you to to start. To I'm trying close, to pass, close your video. I'm trying <laughs> to pass it back to you here, Nate. There we go. All right. Um, and we are going to pass off to Dave Scott. So Dave Scott has a a very a very long title at Raincoast, but uh, Dave is Dave is essentially our our salmon guy. So so. Before I, I actually butcher your entire, entire title here, could you, could you say it out loud for me, Dave? Sure, I'm, just, I'm the, the research and restoration coordinator for the Lower Fraser Salmon Program. Okay, well that's just a little bit of a mouthful. Um, but, but essentially what, what Dave does, so, so Dave is, is a researcher with, with Raincoast, um, unlike myself and Maureen, where we work on the education side of stuff, Dave focuses all his work in very rigorous field-based research, and uh, and he's currently a PhD student at uh, your at the University of British Columbia with the yeah. Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Lab. Uh, so, without further ado, we're going to learn a little bit more about uh, sort of Raincoast's role in in salmon conservation on the coast here. So, uh, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks very much, Nate. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and thanks to Ryder for an amazing presentation. It was uh, really enjoyable to watch and, and really informative and really interesting. So uh, thanks again, Ryder, for that. That was great. Um, so before I start, uh, I'll say, uh, so I'm sitting here in Vancouver. So I'm uh, in the unceded territory of the, uh, the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish. Uh, First Nations, and I'm going to be talking about uh, some research and a big restoration project that we're working on here in the Fraser Estuary, so in the same uh, same area. And yeah, I'm going to be telling you essentially about what I've been doing for about five years now. So I've been with Raincoast ever since uh, the start of 2015, and um, I've mostly been doing, yeah, a lot of research, like Nate said, and I've been lucky enough to turn that into a PhD project for myself. So yeah, I'll tell you about uh, what I worked on. So uh, of course, I work on salmon, you already know that. Um, and I just wanted to bring the, the salmon life cycle back up here. So we know salmon are these uh, amazing migratory species with this really unique life history where uh, they're able to move from uh, the freshwater environment where they, their eggs are uh, incubating. Uh, they come out of the gravel as these little fry. Um, they move uh, down out into the ocean as juveniles, either in their first or second year usually. And then, as Ryder said, they spend this time doing the vast majority of their growing out in the ocean. Uh, that's where they're getting the vast majority of their biomass, and then they have to pass back up into freshwater to get to their spawning areas. And so, in order to make those transitions from freshwater into the ocean and back, they have to pass through estuaries. So, where the river meets the ocean and those two forces mix together, that's the estuary. And to complete their life cycle, um, they have juveniles and then back again as a hey yeah uh, Dave are you still there Miles can uh, rear and grow before they move out into the open so that's what I'm really interested in is juvenile estuary habitats um hey Dave would you mind uh, 
you just froze for a little bit there. Could you could yeah. you just repeat that uh, that last bit there? Your your internet's a little bit shoddy. And on on this slide, and so um, what I'm talking about today is is really uh, examine use of estuary habitats. And so that's what I focus on. As I said, there's a few things that we know about estuary. Sorry about the uh... Technical difficulties here today. Um, <laughs> okay, now can you hear me? That is definitely better. Okay, let's work with that. Okay, so do you have my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. But you're not on full screen yet. <laughs> no, there we go, how about that? Ta da uh, Perfect. Good? Yeah. Great. Okay, so yeah. So what I want to talk about today is uh, how juvenile salmon use estuary habitats. And so uh, juvenile salmon, they come from their freshwater uh, areas where they respond. Um, some juvenile salmon go quickly down to the ocean in their first year of life. Some go down in their second year of life, but all must pass through the estuary uh, to get to the ocean. And some juveniles are really thought to rely on those areas as they make that transition. So uh, this figure, uh, these different numbers show different populations of salmon in the Fraser. And you can see that all those rivers have to come together. Those fish have to move down into that main stem to go through the estuary and out into the ocean. So not only are they thought to, you know, we, we know they have to move through this area, but we have a couple of ideas of why it's important. So. Um, where rivers meet the ocean, you get this mixing of fresh water and that saline ocean water, and you get what is known as brackish water, somewhere in between. Um, and that's supposed to aid juvenile salmon in making that preparation so they can go into that brackish water, finish making those preparations that they need to be able to go out into the ocean where there's a really high salt concentration and they need to be able to um, physiologically adapt to that. So we think that they need that mixing area and then we hear a lot about uh, these nursery areas. So we have this nice picture uh, from Tavish Campbell, I think from up in the Skeen Estuary that's showing a little juvenile sockeye salmon and some eelgrass. And so we have this idea that um, estuaries are this place where there's a lot of food and there's not a lot of predators. So it's a good place for a little juvenile salmon to hang out before they go out to the ocean. And so that's what we're really, what my research is really focused on. And unfortunately, when we talk about estuaries, um, we have to talk about a lot of the threats that Ryder previously mentioned in his presentation. So uh, while juvenile salmon are really abundant in estuaries, unfortunately, often people are really abundant in estuaries as well. And so um, I, you know, I'm living in the, the prime example here in uh, the, the lower mainland with the city of Vancouver, the city of Richmond, uh, and other of uh, the local municipalities that have essentially you know, diked off and reclaimed a bunch of the estuary habitats. And then we have a variety of other threats as well from uh, shipping to uh, dredging to log storage. All of these are, are true in the Fraser Estuary and many other estuaries. So um, we're, we're putting a lot of impacts on these places, but along with that, there is also a big investment in uh, restoring salmon habitats and, and estuaries are actually the focus of some of those major investments. And I'm gonna be talking to you about one of those major investments So all of my work is really focused on the Fraser River watershed. And if you live in uh, Vancouver or Kamloops or Prince George, um, you all that's, which has allowed salmon from all five of the main salmon species So we have. Uh, pink coho and 
Yeah, sorry, sorry about that today, guys. We were having some uh, some internet issues a little bit. Let's see if we can get back on to Dave here. That looks, we see him again. Who knew the internet in Vancouver? Zoom would just like kicked me off. I'm not sure. You're back now. Can you send a? Can you make me the host again? Yep. There you are. You should be host now, and you can start sharing screen. We we see you picking your nose and. I don't think that's what I was doing. All right. Okay. Welcome. Sorry about that, everyone. I'm not sure what's going on here. Probably a, might be on my end. All right. Can you hear me now? Yep. We can. We're back on. Okay. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen again. Um, so yeah, so as I was saying, uh, I work in the Fraser River watershed. It's this amazing watershed that takes up a quarter of British Columbia and is home to uh, a large number of, of salmon populations. And so what I'm really focused on is Chinook salmon. And so Raincoast has a real, really big interest in Chinook salmon currently because Chinook salmon, not only are they really important salmon species, but they're also, uh, but they're also the main prey item of the endangered southern resident killer whales. And um, the southern resident killer whales are an important population uh, that Raincoast has been doing a lot of work on trying to protect. And what we've found is that we really need to help them get more food. And what they really rely on is these Chinooks, specifically from the Fraser River. And so, um, as I mentioned, there's this great diversity of habitats in the Fraser, which means that you have 15 different groups of Chinook. And as those different Chinook uh, come into the river with different run timings, uh, they provide kind of a buffet of Chinook that, uh, that the Southern resident killer whales are used to rely on. Uh, but unfortunately now we're, we have many less Chinook. So uh, Rain Coast is particularly very interested in, uh, in studying these Chinook. And so what we're really focused on is uh, these two populations of Chinook and the Fraser that are really the most estuary reliant. So uh, they're what are known as ocean type Chinook in that they go to the ocean in their first year. And there's two big populations and those two populations actually make up the majority of returns for Chinook in the Fraser River. So uh, there's a Harrison, uh, the three in the bottom of the map there. And then there's the South Thompson population. So the 13 uh, with the red circle around it there. So uh, these two different populations, they're in uh, two different non-overlapping areas, a bit of a different climate, a bit of a different uh, migration pattern that they have, uh, but they both are thought to be this, you know, really estuary reliant group. And unfortunately, when we're talking about Chinook salmon in the Fraser River, if we look at their status, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of red. So um, in 2018, the uh, Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada uh, did an investigation onto the status of, of Chinook in the Fraser and found that uh, half of Can Canada's Chinook salmon are endangered. And they actually found that only one of the 15 Fraser River populations was stable, was doing okay. So, um, so there's a lot of a lot of focus from uh, fishermen, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and and funding going in to try to uh, fix this problem of you know having so many Chinook populations that are not doing well. And so that's why we uh, that's as well why we're really interested in, in looking at Chinook. As well, we know that uh, the vast majority of habitats that these ocean type Chinook used to rely on have been either lost or disconnected. So um, this picture that you're seeing here is the lower mainland with uh, Vancouver in the top left. You have uh, Richmond in the middle and then Delta and Surrey uh, kind of down to the south. And so what you can see is this vast transformation of an area that used to essentially just be, uh, you know, a, an amazing salmon habitat production system. Um, which has now been reduced to, to less than 90, or sorry, less than 10% of the habitats that once existed. So uh, the vast majority of habitats have either been uh, totally lost with streams just paved away under the road and converted into storm drains. And as well, we have uh, a lot of habitat that's been disconnected. So uh, we have agricultural fields that have dikes to protect from flooding. And then all of the streams that are on the inside of that dike are now disconnected and inaccessible to salmon. And when we move out into the estuary, we find that there are numerous barriers which have been created um, 
mostly for the purposes of shipping, uh, which now greatly alter the routes that juvenile salmon use to move around the estuary and really force them to do a lot more work than they want to do to be able to find habitats that they rely on. And potentially these barriers also just push them right out into the ocean before they've even had a chance to use the estuary. So, um, so there's really been a huge, uh, huge change in the habitat that's been available to those uh, two salmon populations. And so back in 2016, I, uh, myself and uh, Misty McDuffie from Raincoast, uh, we started a big research project in partnership with uh, the University of Victoria and a couple of collaborators there. And we wanted to just go out in the Fraser Estuary and try to understand what habitats are really important for juvenile Chinook and other salmon species. And when are they using them? Who's using them? And why are they using them? And so we picked sites. This is a map that shows all the sampling sites that we have in the Fraser Estuary. You can see from uh, Vancouver at the north end to Delta down at the south. And we essentially have three main habitat types. So as the juvenile salmon are moving down the river and just reaching the estuary, we have these marsh areas, which you can kind of see in the middle um, with the, uh, the middle arrow. And then once they get out, to, uh, they leave those marsh areas, they transition across these sand and mud flat areas. And then some of them move down to the south where there's this large eelgrass bed um, that, is, that is cut into three pieces essentially by the Roberts Bank, uh, Port Causeway and the BC Ferries to Wasson Terminal. So um, we have uh, this outer estuary eelgrass system, uh, but it's partially disconnected from uh, the rest of the river. So we wanted to get an idea of those three main habitat types, uh, when and where juvenile salmon are in the estuary. And so we go to the estuary each spring. Uh, this is our fifth season. We're currently uh, getting towards the, more towards the second half of the season for this year. But for the last uh, five years, we've gone out essentially from the beginning of March when it's still really cold. A couple of times we've gone out and there's snow on the marsh from the night before. Uh, but we find uh, juvenile salmon there from March and then we sample all the way through August. And we keep going back every two weeks to try to get an idea of now, when the salmon are coming out, where are they, uh, and how long are they there for? And so we have to use a couple of different nets. We have a beach seine, which is kind of your typical uh, sampling method. We also have a purse seine, which is the photo on the left, uh, which we use out in the eelgrass. And then we also have a fike net on the bottom right-hand corner. So uh, depending on where we are, we try to use the best method that we can uh, that allow us to catch the most juvenile salmon. And so uh, over the years, we've developed a few different methods that has now allowed us to be really efficient at, at catching juvenile salmon when we're in the estuary. So here are some of the results. So I tried to make a, kind of a simplified figure uh, that shows you where, uh, sorry, when juvenile salmon are in the estuary. So when we go out to the estuary at the start of the year, uh, at the end of February and early March, first we see this big push of chum salmon and if it's a pink year then we see pink salmon. So uh, in the Fraser, pink only spawn every second year. So the following year we see their juveniles. And this year happens to be a pink year. And so we've seen a huge number of chum and pink come in really large numbers early in the season. So in March and April, we have this big flush of juvenile chum and pink, but they don't hang around for as long. So you can see that's a big peak that goes right back down. Um, they're pretty much gone by the end of April, getting into early May. But what we see coming in uh, around the same time as that big flush of chum and pink is we see those ocean type Chinook that we're really interested in. And you, so that's the green line on the graph. And unlike the blue and pink lines, which kind of go to zero uh, in early May, you see that that green line continues on. It drops off slowly and then has a second peak moving into June and July, and then starts to drop off slowly down again into August. So those are those ocean type Chinook that I've been talking about. And you can see, so they're in the estuary for entirely, for essentially the entire spring and summer. So we've captured them as early as I think May 5th to as late as August 16th. So um, they're present in the estuary. It's a really important habitat for them uh, for that whole spring and summer period. And then lastly, we also have uh, some sockeye fry that we tend to see in June and July. So unlike the pink and chum, they seem to come out a little bit later. We don't see them in as big of numbers, but uh, we see them using those, uh, those estuary areas as well. But it's really those, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the picture is there. 
And as you can see, these juvenile salmon, they all look pretty much the same. So we have uh, a lot of guessing games to do when we're out in the field to look at those little marks on their side. Those are called par marks. And so we, we, uh, we catch them and then we try to figure out which ones they are. Uh, we're pretty good at this point in year five, but uh, it can be a bit tricky. Um, but those are, those are the main ones that we're catching. And so I really want you to focus for now on that green line. And so you can see that unlike the other lines, the green line has this second peak in it. And so um, I'm very fortunate that I live in uh, the day of modern science technology. And so what we're able to do is I am able to take just a little clip off of the, uh, the, the fin of the tail fin, um, the caudal fin of the Chinook. And I'm able to take that sample, send it back to a lab, and then figure out which population that Chinook is coming from. So if you look at the figure here, you can see the, the big first peak that we saw on that graph. So this is using uh, real data now, uh, is those Harrison Chinook. So those Chinook that are closer to the estuary, they come right down in large numbers earlier in the season. And then when we move into June and July, where we see that second peak, we actually see that that second peak is a different group of ocean type Chinook. It's those South Thompson fish that are coming in and replacing their cousins from the Harrison population. And they're using the estuary for that second part of the summer, that June and July and into August period. So we have these two different populations of ocean type Chinook in the Fraser that both use the estuary, but they use it at different times. So um, reducing the competition between them, reducing that overlap, um, so it's really, really interesting to see, and you see that it's really the ocean type Chinook that use the estuary for the longest period. So along with being in the estuary, we're also curious which are the habitats that are the most important. And what we've really found is that it's those inner estuary marsh habitats where we catch the vast majority of our salmon. So uh, this is a figure just showing our data from year to year, looking at the different habitats and how many salmon we're catching. And you can see that it's a very consistent trend across the four years that the vast majority of the salmon that we catch are in these uh, marsh habitats and the steelgrass that's down at the south and the outer estuary, we actually see very limited use by juvenile salmon. So uh, that could potentially be related to the presence of those, uh, those two barriers down there. Um, but we think it's really, you know, those marsh habitats in the inner estuary, those are the ones that have those brackish conditions that I mentioned. And so we think that's, those are the ones that are really important for juvenile salmon in the Fraser estuary. And so knowing that, we want to go out and try to not just know what the problem is, know what salmon need, we want to do something about it. And so um, with Rain Coast, uh, we were very fortunate back in 2017, we, uh, we started looking at the different barriers in the estuary and we really focused on uh, the Steveston jetty here. So um, this, the yellow trying or the yellow circle is around uh, the Steveson jetty and it's an eight kilometer long rock wall as you can see on the right hand side that was built back in 1915 to control the mouth of the river for the purposes of shipping but there was no consideration for its effect on juvenile Chinook salmon or juvenile salmon of any or any fish species of that matter uh, and also it had there was no consideration of how those changes to those natural processes how pushing that fresh water and fine sediment. So when you look at that picture, you can see the barrier is actually pushing the fresh water and the fine sediment coming down the river out into the Strait of Georgia and potentially pushing juvenile salmon that would otherwise migrate into marsh habitats out into those deep saline waters uh, where they're potentially susceptible to predators and they potentially haven't had a chance to get ready for the salt water. So uh, we thought it was a fine time to do something about that. And luckily, we got some uh, funding from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And then we went and started looking at the jetty. And we saw that at the very start of the jetty, there is one very small opening. And so we started sampling in the marsh behind there. And we found, sure enough, there were juvenile salmon. And so we decided that we wanted to put these three additional openings. So the three blue arrows in the middle of the screen, we wanted to create some openings in that jetty so that juvenile salmon can get into the marsh instead of getting pushed out to sea. And so luckily for us, Fisheries and Oceans Canada agreed that that was a really good idea. And we were fortunate to receive funds from the Coastal Restoration Fund to go out and do just that. So uh, we went out with this big uh, construction machine that's usually used to uh, build some kind of harmful structure in the river. But instead this time we were able to rep repurpose it for good. And we went out and now you can see these three openings that we've made in this jetty. So 
Um, on the, the Google Earth image on the top left here, you can see the three openings that we made. And what we did is we just went and moved the rock out of the way, moved the, the pilings out of the way, and really tried to just allow for natural channel formation. We're not going to dig a channel out onto the banks. We're just going to let the river decide how the channel should be formed over time. And you can see when you look at these, if you kind of scrunch in a little bit, you can see that the breaches, the one to the left has a bit of a channel coming from the back, the one in the middle, not so much, and the one on the right, a much smaller channel. So that's all part of the plan. We're hoping for natural channels to form over time. And essentially as that happens, the project will become more and more effective uh, as those channels form. So uh, we went out, we made three breaches that were 50 meters wide. And then we went right out to try to see if juvenile salmon were moving through them. So uh, the picture on the top left is us cap capturing fish moving through the east breach. And the one on the bottom left is us capturing fish moving through uh, the west breach. And on the right, those are some pictures of some of those little juvenile salmon that we captured. So last year we went out essentially just a few weeks after the breaches were created. And we were super, super excited that we were catching uh, these really small chum and these really small ocean type Chinook moving through the breaches. So um, when we looked at how big those, those juvenile Chinook were that were coming through the breaches, you know, we found that these are really the fish that we find in the marsh, not fish that we find moving out to the sand flats and to the eelgrass. So we have a pretty good idea that you know, these fish were benefiting by moving through our breaches and that if our breaches weren't there, that they would have essentially got pushed out into the Strait of Georgia. So we were really excited. You know, we got, we got a bunch of juvenile Chinook and a bunch of juvenile chum last year. And we thought, hey, that's, you know, that's pretty good. And then we went out this year and we started catching even more and even more. And we have had some amazing days. Luckily this year, um, we were able to catch some uh, stream type Chinook. So some big Chinook that had spent a year in freshwater. We were able to catch some sockeye smolt, so some sockeye that had spent a year in freshwater already. We've been catching some coho smolts moving through as well. And then we've also been catching a lot of juvenile uh, ocean type Chinook, juvenile chum, and juvenile pink. So we're really excited. We feel like uh, we're, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of salmon passage and that, that passage is really benefiting those salmon. So super, super excited to see all of that. And we're gonna be continuing with uh, this project and looking at some new places in the jetty. If you remember back to the image of the barriers I showed, there was much more than just this one barrier. So uh, we're really gonna be looking around at what else can we be doing out there. And so just to wrap things up, uh, a couple of take home messages. Juvenile salmon must use estuaries on their way to the ocean. Uh, but we think there's there's much more to it than that. You know, we find that especially juvenile ocean type Chinook really rely on these estuary habitats as nursery grounds uh, before they move into the ocean. We've also found that the Fraser Estuary marshes support juvenile salmon for over half the year. So half of the year we have juvenile salmon in those brackish marshes in the fresh in the Fraser Estuary. So it's really important that we protect them and we restore them if we're thinking about trying to restore our salmon populations. We also found that juvenile salmon respond uh, really quickly to our restoration action. So we went out, made these openings. We haven't even allowed time for a channel to form, but already we see juvenile salmon moving through. So super excited about that. And so I'm gonna wrap it up here in a minute, but I think it's also a good idea that I lead with uh, a call to action. And so um, there's a lot of different things that you can do to help juvenile salmon. Uh, you can join a local stewardship group or a local stream keeper group. I work, work with a group here called the Still Creek Stream Keepers and uh, we go out to a local creek and we remove garbage. We try to remove invasive species. So if you really want to do something hands-on where you're getting out into the environment, that's a great option. Look for a, a local stream keeper group. Look at the Pacific Stream Keepers Federation. And as well, if you're interested in, in trying to help protect the Fraser Estuary, if you uh, check out Raincoast website right now, um, currently, there's a, a large proposal to build a large uh, port expansion in the Fraser Estuary called the Roberts Bank Terminal 2 Project. Mm -hmm. And this project would really undo mm -hmm. all this good restoration work that we've been doing and add a few, another barrier down in the south that further interrupts the movement of juvenile Chinook salmon in the estuary. And you know, we really think that in this time when we're doing all this work, putting all this investment into restoration, 
it's the wrong time to be expanding uh, the port in, at Roberts Bank. So uh, check it out, Roberts Bank Terminal 2 project, and please uh, tell the minister, Minister Wilkinson, to reject that project. And uh, thanks very much for, for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now. And uh, here's my email on the screen as well. So feel free to shoot me any email questions. And yeah, thanks for listening. Wow, that was wonderful. That was really great, Dave. It was, it was a really neat Thanks. opportunity for, uh, you know, just to learn what you guys are doing there across the, uh, across the pond and the, on the mainland. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, if I could just become the host here, um, that was really great. And what I really liked there was, was you giving us a bit of a, uh, a bit of a call to action uh, I think that's a really important part of these of these programs, and, and that, that that call to action can actually be a lot of fun. So for myself, the first the first bit of stewardship that I got into was volunteering with a, a shorekeepers group, and I learned so many skills through that. And and it really is like this is a field that if you want to get into it, you are going to have to volunteer, and that is the way to get experience and get to hang out with people like Dave and and get to share that expertise. So so that's really great. Um, I am going to take over screen sharing here. All right. So uh, I'd just like to say uh, a big thank you to, to all of our sponsors. Um, this, this program, uh, you know, this online version has is, is been supported by these funders, but also these are the guys that allow us to take youth out into the territories on our, on our vessel and really engage students in a very hands-on and very impactful way. We can see, you know, by example, Ryder here, has, has really been inspired by, by the work that we've got to do. So none of that would be possible without the help from these guys. Um, and yeah, for anyone, if you want to learn a little bit more about Raincoast, we've got the many, many different ways to engage here. And I'm just going to leave this screen up for you guys. But uh, we went a little bit longer than normal today, but there was just so much to know. So I was just thinking we could get into a few questions. We've got both, uh, both Ryder and Dave are available to answer questions. Um, so maybe if you have questions about being a youth involved in stewardship, you can direct them at Ryder. And if we have anything sort of specifically scientific and salmon-y, we'll, uh, we'll go to Dave for that. So uh, let's get all the questions in the chat box, please. Um, so I, I did hear one question before that said, um, I believe it was asking, is the hybrid, um, would the hybrid be dangerous to other, other individuals, so other salmon in the populations? Since it's such a new discovery, we actually don't know if it's gonna be harmful or a positive for these salmon. The scientific paper released in September will have much, much more detailed information on the implications of this fish. Um, okay, so a question sort of that I'm gonna redirect there to, to Dave is, has this, has this been observed in other species? And like, what is the significance of, of finding this, this hybrid from a genetic perspective? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a geneticist, but uh, I'd be curious to know, like, if, if there's more, like, is, is there just one? Is, is there more? Is there a chance that they can, that this hybrid can actually reproduce and, and produce viable offspring? That, that, that'll be some really interesting questions there. Like, you know, is it just a, a one-off accident or are, are there more of these out there? Or, uh, you know, is, is there a future where we, we're going to see more of these? Um, or is it just kind of that, that one off uh, that, you know, that just happened to happen? It, it makes sense that a Chinook and a Coho would, would be able to produce a successful hybrid. They are the most, they're most closely related to each other of any of the salmon species. So um, Coho and Chinook are, are quite closely related. They already look very, very similar to each other. Uh, I've been struggling to tell them apart for the last uh, few days. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're very similar already. So it's, uh, it'd be very interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, if there's any way that, um, the hybrids would be able to seek each other out to mate or, or whether it's kind of a dead end, uh, yeah, that's, uh, those would be some of my uh, additional questions. Yeah, that, that's great. That's, that's really interesting, uh, really interesting stuff. So on the, just keeping on that, that train and in the world of Chinook. So this is going 
sort of more specifically to, to your work and trying to boost uh, Chinook populations. And this is a really big question for a lot of the work that Rainclose does. So, so why do orcas prefer Chinook salmon over other salmon? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think it's a pretty simple answer, actually. They're the biggest. So, you know, they, sa Chinook salmon have a few different nicknames. Um, well, actually, both of their nicknames, uh, I think, give you a good clue as to why they're important. So uh, the, you'll often hear Chinook called spring salmon. And that's because Chinook are the first ones to come back in the spring. So you can have them coming back uh, already in the river at this point, coming back in May and June. So really coming back early. And they're also the largest, so they're called king salmon often. And you may have seen photos of these gigantic, you know, Chinook salmon as big as a person. And back in the, the 60s and 70s and probably 80s, people, when they went out fishing for Chinook salmon, they wanted to get a tie, and they considered that a 50-pound Chinook. And now if you go fishing for Chinook salmon, you're lucky to get a 30-pound Chinook. But when killer whales evolved to focus on eating Chinook. There, there were these 50 pound Chinook and they were coming back with this really good distribution uh, across from the, there's spring runs, there's summer run and there's fall runs. So you have this kind of portfolio of food coming to you across the spring, summer and fall and they're huge. So they're easier to echolocate and locate. And when you do get one, it's a much better meal. So that would be my assumption. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes a whole lot of sense. I've heard the, uh, you know, when, when they find a big, a big fish, they'll share it um, amongst yeah. the family members. And it doesn't make sense for uh, an orca to share a five pound uh, pink salmon, does it? No. That's a white start. Yeah. Siblings, not gonna have any part of that. Um, so we have a question that was asking specifically about the Cowichan hybrid and whether, um, just wondering how many individuals were actually be found, whether it was just a one-off or whether they were seeing more than just the one. Either of you guys know the answer to that? The numbers right now, because it's such a recent discovery, are unknown. They were actually just out tracking the Chinook, and just by flunk, they discovered this new hybrid when they sent the, like you said, Dave, the anal fin there. I, What'd you call that? Oh. Yes, when they sent the caudal fin off, they noticed it had genes from both fish. Hmm. The numbers, though, are still being recorded. Okay, hmm. great. It's interesting because uh, you would think that, uh, you know, if, if there was one female and one male, like like Ryder said, you know, they produce hundreds of eggs, so there's got to be more than just one offspring. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'm excited to see sort of the release of that paper and see, uh, yeah, a little bit, little bit more about that. I think it's it's pretty neat, kind of having uh, Ryder. I'm really glad that you chose to to talk about a topic that's very, very close to to your home and and your heart. And I think that's kind of a a running theme with with each of these presentations is that people are are, are choosing to study and choosing to present on topics that they care a lot about. And obviously, the the couch in the Cowichan system is, is very important to you and, and same goes for you, Dave. The, uh, the health of the Fraser seems like a, a very important, very important to you. So, so that's something that I, I really love to see through this, through this program is people really engaging locally and, and getting involved with, with local programs and, and really getting to know your, your local environment. And, and really with that comes that love and that understanding of these places. And, and I think that's a really, really important part um, so we've we've pretty well used up our, our time here. We could do one more question if anybody has one sort of final question in the chat box here. Um, we'll see if something comes. There was one that I'd like to revise and it was my slide where I had said, we're raising funds on the down payment of the Kittelope. And someone had said, yes, we actually do have the down payment on that. That's because this was an older presentation and I had missed that, so my bad. Yeah, all good. That's that's great. So yeah, the status is last year we purchased the uh, the Nadia tenure. This year we are working on the Kitlope tenure. And uh, all things all things provided, depending on COVID, we will hopefully be bringing up some of our supporters to the Kitlope and uh, and getting to explore that area and, and really expose people to it. And and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get that tenure purchased by the by the end of. Uh, 
of the year. So we had a question here, can you join Streamkeeper groups? And I think it's specifically about youth and absolutely. That's how you get to do all the grunt work. You got to move a bag of, of gravel. You got to, you got to use those young backs. Um, okay. <laughs> So uh, I, I think that we're gonna we're gonna leave it at that today. Um, that was really great, and and thank you both. Um, a big thank you to Ryder. Ryder is a uh, a grade twelve student, and and he's here on the uh, on the internet. And I can attest that despite being in your own living room, this is quite stressful. So I just like to say a huge thank you to Ryder and and the other junior leaders that are to come. Uh, you guys are doing really amazing work, and and we're really excited to have you a part of our team. Uh, so that's going to be all for this week. Next week, we are moving on. We are still staying on the topic of salmon because, well, salmon are important. Uh, so we're going to have session number two on salmon. We're going to be talking about salmon in the urban landscape. And we are going to have Fernando Lessa giving a presentation. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank all of you, uh, all of you participants. Thank you very much for uh, for all your engagement. And it's really nice to see a few uh, familiar faces and names in the mix there. Um, thank you very much, and goodbye for this week. Take care. Amazing. Bye, Nate. Cool. That was good. <laughs>